Hi, welcome back to today's real estate. I'm Lauren Keim and today we're going to be talking about whether you should buy a home now or wait for the future. First, I want to start by explaining that you have to understand that owning a home is a great investment. The last few years of declining real estate prices have programmed too many of us to believe that buying a home is a bad investment. It's not. Some of you believe that you should save for a few years, create a bigger down payment, and prices might even go down further. I think that's a bad idea, and I'll explain why. Let me look at it a little differently, though. Isn't it true that when we buy cars, most of us look less at the sticker price than at what the car is actually going to cost us over the next five years as we're making payments on it, rather than leasing the same car? We buy a home for many reasons. We buy them so we can pick and choose our own colors. We buy them to have a sense of security. We buy a home so we can have a permanent place to raise our families that's not subject to a landlord selling it out from under us. And we buy homes so that we can lock in our future payments rather than be at the mercy of inflation and rent increases. And we buy homes in order to have no house payment in 30 years when we're getting ready to retire and we're on fixed incomes. Sadly, we have very short memories. We tend to only consider the last few years when prices fell and when many of our friends and neighbors lost their homes because they lost their incomes, they couldn't keep up with the payments. Historically, home ownership has been one of the best investments an individual or a family can make for their retirement. And historically, interest rates have been a lot higher than they are today. There have always been people losing their jobs due to the economy, factory shutdowns or illness, the difference in the recent past is that housing prices fell so precipitously in many parts of the country that homeowners simply couldn't sell their homes to pay off their mortgages. They had to renegotiate the payoffs through a short sale or they had to walk away leaving the home to foreclosure. What we forget is that market corrections have happened throughout history. And although this is one of the worst we've ever faced over the last century, it's certainly not unique. And like the roller coaster of life, the market will at some point reverse direction and improve. In fact, I believe we're going to start seeing that over the next year. If truth be told, we all know that those who will be real estate rich a decade from now are the ones who will purchase the most property at the bottom of the market, don't we? The question might be, how can we time the market? And I want to suggest that we don't have to right now because it's such a great time to buy. In the New York Times best-selling book, The Tipping Point, Malcolm Gladwell made a strong case for the concept that there's a point where an idea, a trend, or a behavior reaches explosive growth. Just like a single sick person can start an epidemic of the flu, the right combination of factors can lead to a large segment of the population to form the same belief or move in the same direction. We've seen that in real estate. Now there are reporters and politicians telling us that real estate will never rise again. And in fact, it'll drop another 10 or 20 or 50 percent below the before the bottom's reached. There's shadow inventory secretly held by the banks and every other person is defaulting and prices will plunge for the next decade. These purveyors of doom are, ignor are ignoring some fundamental truths. The population is continuing to expand rapidly. Part of this expansion is the result of immigration. Part is attributed to birth rates and seniors living longer. A growing population means an increased demand for housing for that population, which ultimately leads to prices rising. Supply and demand are a fundamental part of economics. Additionally, the Federal Reserve printing a lot of paper money means we dilute and devalue the dollar, which leads to inflation. Although inflation creates high interest rates, which is bad for the housing market, it also means that everything you buy costs more and housing inevitably follows the same pattern. So while we hear there'll never be another real estate boom, we know this isn't true. There will be another tipping point in the market because history repeats itself and our memories are painfully short. And I repeat, those who will be real estate rich during the next boom are those who are buying right now. Another consideration is that there are people leaping to buy gold right now because they see gold as a real tangible asset rather than paper money. Isn't real estate also a tangible asset? Isn't real estate, if it's purchased correctly, a solid investment that can't go to zero like General Motors stock or many other bankrupt, too big to fail companies did? If a home is purchased at a low enough down payment or low enough payment that can easily be rented to cover that mortgage payment, you can weather any storm with real estate by simply renting the asset. Let's re-examine the reasons why we buy houses. Although historically homes have been a great investment in a retirement plan, that's not the primary reason that we buy. 
We buy to both lock in our housing costs and to secure something that's truly ours. A mentor of mine, Ralph Williams, once told me that real estate is the tip of the iceberg of free society. If you can't own land and are required to lease it from some government or third party as a surf would, you can't truly be free. We buy homes even when the monthly payment or the monthly cost of home ownership is higher than the current rental rates because we know the cost of renting a property will continue to rise with inflation. And in many parts of the country, right now, the monthly payment on a median priced home is actually less than a monthly rental payment on the same type of property. If rents follow inflation and rents rise at a very low 2.5% each year, in 20 years, your $1,000 rental payment today will be nearly $1,600 a month. In 30 years, when you'd be paying off your home if you took out a 30-year mortgage, your rent would be over $2,000 and keep rising until you die, leaving no home as part of your estate. If inflation is a more realistic, a more typical 35 to 4% per year over the next few decades, your $1,000 payment today will be $1,922 in 20 years at 3% and over $2,100 if it, the inflation rate averages 4%. In 30 years, at 3.5% inflation rate, you'll be paying $2,711 a month for that $1,000 payment today, or over $3,100 a month if inflation is at about 4%. Let's say our government policy to spend, spend, spend leads us to inflation of 7%, which incidentally is still far below the inflation rates of the late 70s and early 80s. That means your rent is going to jump from 1000 bucks to 3616 in year 20 and over $7,100 in year 30 when you're looking to retire. If you bought a home with a $1,200 mortgage payment today in that first year, your payment would still be $1,200 until it's paid off, other than increases in property taxes and insurance, which can be deducted off your income tax. Now, before I start showing you some real numbers, those of you who are math challenged may want to duct tape your head so it doesn't explode. Let me explain why interest rates are so important. Interest rates are the other key to why buying, buyers should be out there buying homes today. Although fluctuating on a daily basis, rates have been around 4%, 4.5% for a 30-year fixed rate loan to a borrower who has decent credit. Obviously, rates can be different depending on somebody's credit score, on how much money they put down, on the term of the loan taken, and so on. But let's take a typical 30-year, 10% down conventional loan at a 4.875% interest rate as the basis for our discussion. And by the way, that's higher than the rates that we're dealing with right now. Due to the public's fear and panic over falling real estate prices and the significant impact of foreclosures over the last two years, I believe the market is overcorrected. I know a lot of people disagree with me, but I do. As a percentage of income, it's actually cheaper to buy the median home today in many parts of the country than at any point since the 1950s. When my firm first opened in Allentown, Pennsylvania in the early 1980s, interest rates were around 17%. Further back in the late 60s, early 70s, rates were 8% or above. That is double the payment of a 4% loan today for the same amount that you're borrowing. Even when the market boomed in the late 1980s and things were going great, rates were north of 8% and at many points they were higher than 10%. Inflation has made housing prices higher today than any time in the 1970s, 80s, or 90s, obviously. And it's also made our income significantly higher than our parents and our grandparents from those same eras. Since home prices have fallen over the last few years and rates have remained historically low, you can borrow money and buy the median home in many parts of the country with a payment of only about 14 to 20 percent of your gross monthly income. That's far below the percentage of monthly income we spent in prior decades to own real estate. The key factor I'm trying to get across is that if you buy a home and you lock in a payment, as long as you aren't transferred to another region of the country, the immediate home price that you pay doesn't matter nearly as much as the payment because over the long term, values will rise. I believe interest rates are going to rise too. Many experts and economists agree with me. The question is, how much will they go up? For those viewers who are screaming that rates will not rise, I'm going to address that in a minute. Depending on inflation, rates may only rise 1% over the next year, or they might rise 3 to 5% over the next two years. If we hit some sort of hyperinflation based on the country's borrowing habits, all bets on interest rates are off. What does this mean on a typical home purchase? 
If you bought a $200,000 home, for example, with a 10% down payment, your mortgage payment would be less than 1000 bucks a month. $952.57 plus taxes and insurance. Again, this is based on a 30-year loan. If rates rise just over 1% over the next year and you wait to purchase, that same payment will be $1,064, which is $112 more a month, $1,346 more per year, and over $40,000 more during the term of the loan. That's for buying the same house. You're going to be paying $40,000 more over the term of the loan and at least $112 more a month. That's if it rises 1%. Let's say the rates rise 3% over the next 18 months and you wait to buy. And there are many people who predict that. That same mortgage is going to cost you $1,305 a month. That's $352 more per month than you pay today and another $126,918 in additional interest you'll pay over the life of the loan. I also have trouble believing that the majority of potential future home buyers realize that you can own a home today, a $200,000 home today, for less than $1,000 a month before taxes and insurance. How much will you pay to lease the same home? And think about it this way. How much will you pay to lease that same home 10 years from now if you don't buy? Let's take it to an extreme. Let's say the interest rates spike back up to 10%. Remember when our firm opened, they were 17. But let's say they go back up to 10% where they've been for many, many years before this current period of exceptionally low rates. At 10%, that same $952 payment would cost $1,579, which is $627 more per month for the same house, or over $225,000 more in interest and payments over the life of the loan. But Lauren, what if prices drop? If I were a gambler, I'd bet against any more significant drops in housing prices, because although there are still many foreclosures yet to dump into the marketplace, the number of borrowers going into default has been dropping, and the unemployment rate has been dropping. I know it's a valid concern, however. No one wants to pay $200,000 for a house today and find out it's worth 10% less next year. But I don't think it could be. Let's use an example. Let's select a Midwestern suburban area where housing prices have dropped 21% over the past five and a half years. This is a typical scenario across the country. I know there are areas that have been hit much harder, like Las Vegas and Orlando, but we're looking at normal markets. If the average price drop was about 4% a year and some segments of the economy are improving, it's reasonable to assume a drop shouldn't exceed more than 4%, right? A buyer of a $200,000 home could lose $8,000 in equity if prices erode another 4% over the next year and they bought today. Yet if the buyer stays in the home as the market recovers, he'll recoup that equity. But what what if he could buy today at 4.875% interest rate and waiting a year cost him a 1% bump in that interest rate? That $200,000 purchase today would cost him $952 a month, based again on a 30-year loan, 10% down payment, normal credit. Buying the same home next year for $192,000, but at a rate 1% higher, will actually cost him $70 more a month, $1,022 a month, even though he's paying less for the house. Now let's say rates spike up to 7.875% if they go up 3%. That same home, now at $192,000, will cost $1,252 a month. So you're losing more than $300 a month by waiting. Now, what if your gamble of waiting doesn't pay off and both prices and interest rates rise? Something to think about. Let me address the question you've been asking. Why will interest rates rise? As I warn potential of the potential of rising interest rates at workshops around the country, I inevitably get someone in the audience who argues, Lauren, they say, interest rates will not rise because the government cannot allow it. Well, here's a news flash. The government does not control home mortgage interest rates. The government can influence them for a period of time, but they do not set the rate. What they set is not the home mortgage rate, and people misconstrue that often. There are two parties to every mortgage. There's a borrower who's buying the house, and there's the organization who loans the money to the borrower, the bank or the lender. For a bank or a lender to loan money to another, they have to receive some sort of benefit for loaning that money, and that's the interest paid by the borrower. Although that may sound simplistic, the way the real world works is that large organizations like Fannie Mae buy up billions of dollars in mortgages from Wells Fargo and Chase and everywhere else, 
They package them as mortgage-backed securities and resell them on the secondary market. If banks and Fannie Mae can't get loans sold, the supply of money goes down, meaning there's less money to lend people, which drives the interest rate up. I'm oversimplifying, of course, but that's the basic way mortgages work. Mortgage rates change based on the interest rates paid by federal treasuries and on inflation. Let me explain. Treasuries are considered to be the safest investments in the world because they are backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government, meaning the risk of default is very, very low. That's the safest investment somebody can put money in. Unlike U.S. Treasury bills and Treasury bonds, mortgages are not risk-free. Some people go into foreclosure and default. That means we have to entice investors to purchase mortgages by offering a higher rate than treasuries, based on a risk factor. Treasury rates have to be higher than inflation or the investor will lose money. For example, if an investor purchases a treasury bond that pays 3% interest, but inflation is 4%, the investment is not keeping up with inflation and the bond will be worth less at the end of the term than it was at the beginning. Mortgage rates have to be higher than treasury rates which have to be higher than inflation, or the loans cannot be sold, and borrowers will have a difficult time obtaining financing for their home. The two primary reasons that mortgage rates have been held so low for this extended period is that inflation has been virtually non-existent, and the Fed has been purchasing bonds in order to influence the rates, keeping them artificially low. As this eases, and it will, rates will necessarily rise. Final thought. Qualifying now versus later. As the rates rise, consumers' buying power diminishes. For example, if you're a typical family earning around $50,000 a year, you could afford about $1,166 a month if we use a qualifying ratio of 28% of your gross monthly income. If we estimate that the taxes and insurance are going to cost you about $300 a month, which certainly depends on the state and the location of the property, your principal and interest payment, your actual mortgage payment, can't exceed $866 per month. While $866 a month gives a family like yours the buying power to borrow $163,700 today at 4.875%, it means you can only borrow a little over $146,000 if rates go up by 1%. If rates jump 3% over the next 18 months, your ability to borrow is now less than $120,000 while you qualify for $163,700 today. So what's keeping people from buying? They should be running out and buying houses now, right? Certainly there are fewer consumers in the marketplace that qualify to purchase a home than a few years ago. Credit scores have dropped for those who let their homes go into foreclosure or gave them back to lenders as a deed in lieu or sold their homes as a short sale to get out. Restrictions on lending have tightened as well. Not as much as people think, but they have tightened. PMI companies are scrutinizing transactions and lenders are requiring higher credit scores and in some cases more money down. Effectively, that means there are fewer potential buyers than perhaps there were in 2006. But the hidden truth is that the vast majority of Americans can still buy a home. The key to unlocking the floodgates of buyers is when first time buyers make that initial leap into home ownership. In a normal market, first-time buyers generate three or more transactions. They purchase a home, which leads the owner of that home to move up to a moderate-priced home. That owner, in turn, makes a lateral move to another area, or they move into a luxury home, and the luxury homeowner moves into a smaller home or a retirement home. It's a lot of transactions created by one first-time home buyer. In addition to the challenge that we've had over the last few years with home buyers not wanting to take that plunge into home ownership, Many of those first-time home buyers were actually able to find homes that were foreclosures or short sales, which are both homes that the prior owner is really unlikely to go out and buy another home. So the chain of the transactions ends with the first sale. Right now, many of these potential first-time buyers are sitting on the sideline. Consumers overwhelmingly want to own their own home rather than throw money away every month to a landlord. And yet they're not making a move to home ownership. While some are waiting for another tax credit, which will probably never come, uh, still others are waiting for uh, a drop in interest rates, which is even more or less likely. And still others are waiting for the government to give away homes for free. Just listen to some of the Wall Street protesters and you'll learn that. The more rational consumers are not buying because of fear. They're afraid that prices might fall, they're afraid of their mortgage qualifications, and they have a lack of disposable income in some cases. Uh, they're worried about unexpected expenses of home ownership. 
They worry that prices will fall further because everyone knows someone who took a terrible hit in this current real estate depression. And let's face it, it is a depression. Buyers have a fear that they won't qualify for a mortgage. As I mentioned earlier, many don't even want to try because they don't want to be embarrassed applying for a mortgage. They've heard from family members, friends, and coworkers that it's nearly impossible to get a mortgage. That is absolutely not true. But they don't want to go for a mortgage to be denied. And finally, disposable income has been a real concern. Buyers don't feel as wealthy if they're paying 70 or 80 bucks to fill up their gas tank, have higher utility bills and higher grocery bills, have no return on their savings account, and they're watching their money evaporate in the stock market. But as buyers begin to once again realize the dream of home ownership and overcome those fears, the market will turn. And those who buy at these historically low interest rates will benefit and everyone else will follow. History always repeats itself. As always, thanks very much for watching our program here today's Real Estate. And if you're planning on selling a home this year, please check out my book, How to Sell Your Home in Any Market, The Six Reasons Homes Don't Sell. It's available everywhere. Realtors, you can certainly pick up a copy of my book, Compelling Buyers to Call, How to Attract Buyers in Today's Market. It's available at barnesandnoble.com or amazon.com. Or a great gift this holiday season might be my book of funny real estate stories called Life Lessons from the Backseat of My Car. Have a great week, and I'll see you next time. Yeah.